you imagine the Supreme Court saying, oh, he didn't engage in insurrection? They're never going to do that. They'd look like, you know, it would look terrible because everybody knows what really happened that day. Hello, everyone. This is JVL. Welcome to a special, a very special episode of The Next Level with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller. Sarah, but you got something actually very special for us. Lay it on me. Yeah, so here's here's what I did. You know how I'm always on this podcast being like, well, I'm not a lawyer, and you know true. that's true, right? True. So part of the problem with this uh, upcoming news cycle is that it's just all about lawyer stuff. Like well, on Friday, we got this like big news about the Supreme Court's going to hear Trump's appeal on the Colorado, and the problem is I don't understand any of it that well. And so I called up my buddy George Conway, the Society for the Rule of Law, and I was like, George, I'm going to need you to explain all this law stuff to me like I'm five. Uh, and so he did. He did. And so we got a, a little special app here of me asking George all the questions that I've had on the legal stuff. Uh, if you guys like it, we might make it a more regular thing. Uh, we're George talking Conway about explains everything. So I think we're going to call it George Conway <laughs> explains it all. Parenthetical to Sarah. What do we think about that? <laughs> well, I'm excited about this. I have to tell you, I'm like not that really impressed with lawyers mostly. And despite also not being a lawyer, kind of think I can fake it till I make it mostly. But one yeah. lawyer I am impressed with is George. So I, I'm pumped to be, you know, kind of edu- edumacated. I know most people know him as like a corgi guy on Twitter, anti-Trump guy, whatever. He's actually a brilliant legal mind. And um, uh, I just kind of I just put a quarter in the machine. So let's hear it. Right. It's on the YouTubes. You're looking. It's on at the it right YouTubes. Now, so make sure it's you on check the YouTubes, it out on the YouTubes and it's too. on the pods. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of the Bulwark, and I am here with my good friend George Conway, who is what they call a lawyer. And I a am what? somebody. I'm right, a recovered a, lawyer. Or, or is, but you, you know, you you have one of those okay. degrees that they give you okay. from law school. Yeah. I see Allegedly. you on the TV. I read yeah, you yeah. in the Atlantic. Yeah. But I, George, am what they call not a lawyer. As Uh-oh. people who listen to me on the Bulwark know, I am constantly having to say I'm not a lawyer. And it is much to my dismay that so many of the political things that we are going to discuss over the next year as we go through this election require a law degree because we have a former president who is a criminal who's been indicted on 91 counts. We've got states kicking him off ballots. We've got an obscure... Uh, segment of the Constitution, it's section three. It's just three. one giant witch hunt. Just what? one giant <laughs> witch hunt. He is appealing. So there's just so many things going on. Here's the thing. We yes. are going to do a segment that we, I, I texted George. And I was like, you got you to do a segment. We're going to call it George Conway Explains It All to Sarah like she's five. Okay? okay. Because I believe Okay, little people Sarah, out there, would you like a lollipop, Sarah? <laughs> Sarah? I, I don't, I'm not ice cream. To, I'm not trying to demean like myself or my intelligence. Okay. What I'm trying to do, though, is I believe that there is a hunger out there okay. for people who want to understand what all this news is legally, but are not lawyers themselves, and they don't want to get into the weeds, but they want to understand why this matters so much, right? Okay. And you have a piece in The Atlantic today, which I read, and still, I understood it, but it was still a little over my head. And so here's the thing I want to start with. I just want to start with some, some, a basic thing, which is Friday. The Supreme Court says they're going to hear Trump's appeal, basically, of this Colorado decision to keep him off the ballot under the 14th Amendment. And I guess for me, as somebody who doesn't understand the legal side, the one thing I do understand, and that you were saying this in your piece, but I want to get into it, is this is this this section of the Constitution is a completely novel, unlitigated section of the Constitution, right? So my understanding is normally with the law, people talk about it a lot. It's litigated over and over again so that the Supreme Court, right, has lots to fall back on when it has to rule in a major case, like whether or not to keep a president off the ballot. But because there's basically been no discussion of this since the Civil War, they are now going to have to make a big decision about whether or not this, whether or not Trump can be on the ballot in like 30 days. And so that right. is that is that why this is so insane? Like first, just to explain why this is such a big deal. Well, it's a big deal for the reason you just said. And it's not novel in the sense that this is something that has been in the Constitution since, I, I guess, 1868. 
But it's novel to us because we haven't had insurrectionists seeking public office in our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our parents and probably in our grandparents, unless you're like Zachary Taylor's uh, grandson who apparently is alive. So um, that's the reason why people are looking at it and say, well, where did this come from? And the answer is it came from the fact that after the Civil War, Congress, the Reconstruction Congress, realized, hey, wait a minute. We sent all these guys home, you know, with their weapons and, and the officers got to keep their sidearms and they're just going to run for office again. And we're going to have to do this all over again. What are we going to do about that? And so one of the things they did, you know, 13th Amendment, they got they, they, they formally abolished slavery. They, for, for, I mean, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, they guaranteed equal protection of the laws. And they also had this provision that prevented people who then engaged in insurrection uh, from holding further office. And then it was forgotten about for a long period of time, other than by historians, until somebody said, hey, wait a minute, we have this president, who, former president, who wants to run again, and he incited this insurrection, and he engaged in insurrection. And these two law professors, um, one of whom I went to law school with, both members of the Federal Society, wrote an article a very good article based upon the you know all the methods that conservatives have been preaching about how to interpret the Constitution for the last 40 years. Um, originalism, the textualism, uh, looking at the legislative the, the legislative history or the context in which mean, words were drafted. And they came to the conclusion that this language in Section 3, which is pretty simple, um, barred Donald Trump. And okay. so right Hold now, on. okay. Hold on. Okay, I'm, talking okay, so I'm just going to stop okay. for one second. No, 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 okay. just because, because I'm, I'm, it's supposed to be five here and I'm not sure that my, I'm going to recap. I'm going to recap okay. what I think All I heard right. you just say. Okay. The first part of what you're arguing here is why you think the 14th amendment is valid, right? Yeah, that's what you're saying. And it, that's interesting to me in part because I read in your, that in your piece, but when you and I talked a while back, you weren't sure that you thought that you agreed with our colleague and by our colleague, your colleague and a guy I know because um, I'm not a lawyer and not his colleague. Well, but but you both thought the 14th Amendment, he was very, he felt very sure that the 14th Amendment should apply in this instance. And you were a little more medium on that. You were like, uh, yeah, I'm thinking it through. And then you got, I, you know, I, I was, I have to say I came with a bit of a prejudice against um, the application of section, I mean, of, of the 14th Amendment, section three in that I want to see this guy, um, I want to see this guy beaten like a drum because I think it would be best for the country politically for this guy to be trounced in the 2024 election. And I do think at the end of the day, for reasons that would be, you, know, you could have another podcast on, I think that's what would happen or will happen if he's on the ballot. But that said, I mean, I also have this you know, this, this instinct in me of like, well, if the law says it, we have to apply the law. So the question was, so I was sort of agnostic for a while and skeptical of the politics of it. It wasn't my preferred result, leaving apart the question of whether or not it was constitutionally required. And then I kind of read more and more, and then I got into it again, reading very carefully the Colorado decision and the dissents. And the dissents are very... Dissents are very useful things in, in, in appellate courts because they represent, if there's, a, if there's a criticism or a weakness in a majority opinion, you're going to see a smart dissenting judge just cut, cut through it like butter. And I didn't see anything remotely compelling in any of the dissents in the Colorado case. And I read the Colorado decision the, the majority opinion, and it was all the arguments I'd seen before it, 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 and in their most refined form. And I thought, okay, this, is, this doesn't look like a fair fight. I'm, I'm convinced. Okay. And then the second one, though, the second one is the one I want to ask you about because yes. you're saying, okay, Congress didn't have to convict him. Like, obviously, we wouldn't be here today if Congress had just done its job and convicted him right after, Senate, especially— yes. I'm, yes. uh, yeah, the Senate specifically, especially since, you know, if you go back and read what they said back then, a whole bunch of them, Marco Rubio and mm -hmm. uh, Mitch McConnell were saying things like, well, you know, he's not president anymore. And so the, if, if, if people want to use the law, you know, the law will be there to, to hold him accountable. Right. And most and notably Mitch McConnell. Right. Most, yeah. most notably Mitch McConnell, although Mitch McConnell hasn't, he's been silent as a church mouse on this. 
But on February 13, 2021, right after the acquittal was entered and the chief justice went back across the street, he gave a speech on the Senate floor basically saying, we have a criminal law in this country. President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen. We have a criminal justice system in this country, and former presidents are not immune from being accountable by either one. And if Donald Trump, basically, if Donald Trump committed a crime here, and you have a pretty good argument there was, that's, that's the recourse. And, yeah. um, if you, and, and somebody sent me the other day, um, somebody who wanted to be rain, remain nameless but was kind of obsessed with this issue, he, he went through the congressional record and, you know, all the remarks that the senators made at the time that they voted and then, you know, obviously they, they revised and extended their remarks as they all do. And he tallied how many Republicans actually thought, actually voted to not to convict him on the grounds that he was not guilty as opposed to um, the, the, the legal fig leaf that they used by saying that, that you know, he's, he's out of office so we can't really do anything to him, which I think was wrong. And about 70 of, there were 70 senators, okay, um, um, Democrats and Republicans, who did not, who basically voted, who, who expressed the view that the guy was responsible for January 6th. So yeah. if they had, you know, if, if, if you take that seriously, um, you know, he should have been convicted. But they, they didn't take their job seriously. They thought he'd just go away and, sorry, here we are. But I will say this is the one argument that I've heard, and maybe I even made it early. Yeah. Days because I was sort of like, doesn't somebody have to convict him of insurrection? No. So that we know, and that's your point there is you're saying, no, the courts can determine. There's like the Colorado Supreme Court is within its right, right to determine that Trump fomented an insurrection and make that right. judgment that he should be kept off the ballot. Right. I mean, you don't have to have you know, somebody, you know, there are other qualifications to be president. You don't need a judicial proceeding for a secretary of state to decide that somebody who says that their birth date is 1990 is not old enough to be president of the United States. I mean, there are other requirements, and it doesn't require litigation to establish those. And if Congress, but more importantly, to go back to, you know, to put on, to channel my inner, inner Antonin Scalia, if Congress had meant to say that people had to be convicted of a crime, the crime of insurrection, in order to be disqualified, they knew how to use that language, they, and they did not use that language, and with good reason. I mean, you, you're going to have – what happened was that at the end of the Civil War, I mean, for example, Appomattox, they, they collected all the arms of the enlisted men, put them in a big pile of the, of the, of the Confederate enlisted men, they let the officers keep their sidearms and horses and just send everybody home because you couldn't imprison everybody, all hundreds of thousands of – of, of Southerners who, who bore arms against the United States. You couldn't imprison them all. You couldn't prosecute them all. So it didn't make any sense to have a conviction requirement. And it wasn't, you know, it, it, there wasn't, it wasn't going to be much dispute about who took up arms against the United States and who didn't. Basically, every able-bodied white man in the South took up arms against the United States. So it, wasn't, yeah. it didn't make any sense to have a conviction requirement. But I guess the, the questions were, the difference is, is like, so as people talk about the age or, um, you know, being a citizen of the United States, so there are objective standards. And I guess the question is, is in, and even in the Civil War, if you fought for the South, I guess it was pretty easy to know that you, or were an officer in the South, that you uh, engaged in insurrection or sedition, because that was sort of commonly thought. But like, I think the question is, is the, is the, is, did Trump, Trump engage in an objective definition of insurrection? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, I, okay, yeah. I listen to voters all the time, right? And they'll always be like, well, the people who went in the building, that's different. Trump didn't do anything. He just said some stuff. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's, that's just poppycock because, you know, he, I mean, here's, here's a guy, by the way, who assaulted a Secret Service agent Watch your to try to go up to the show, hill. George. What did I say? Did I say I said, word? You said poppycock. I was just joking. Poppycock. Oh, okay. <laughs> I usually say bullshit. But they get in trouble for that. But um, it's poppycock, and um, it's not just about what he said on January sixth, which you know had the intended effect of sending these people up to the hill. He knew. I mean, there's so many different facts about January sixth 
that are damning, that he knew these people were armed, that they were, you know, they weren't refusing to come through the magnetometers because they were armed. He said he didn't care because they weren't out here to get him. He told them to fight about 16 times. He used similar language. He said, if we don't go up there, we're not going to have a country. I mean, you know, in the context of what he was seeing in front of him, it was obvious that he was inciting violence. And other people noted that too. I noted it like 24, 48 hours before I did a hit on Morning Joe where I said, God knows what's going to happen on January 6th. These people are coming here with weapons. And, I, you know, I, I, it was pretty, I mean, he caused this to happen. He was, he was a direct cause, I mean, as, this, as the Colorado Supreme Court held, because none of this would have happened without him. It was his lies that got all these people to come to Washington. He urged them to come to Washington because it, quote, unquote, will be wild. I mean, he was the central figure in inciting and or basically organizing this insurrection. And it was an insurrection because an insurrection doesn't require, you know, it doesn't have to be a coup, they taught. It doesn't have to be a successful coup. It doesn't have to be a rebellion, a full-scale rebellion um, like the Civil War. An insurrection, if you look at the definition, means just, you know, some attempt, some resistance to civil authority and an attempt to, phys to stop civil authority from carrying out its functions. And that's what they did that day. And they, they, they tried to stop the most important function you could ever imagine in the United States, which is the essential peaceful transfer of power from one democratically elected administration to another. So, I, you know, I, it's not – there's no – it's pretty obvious why Trump's people in their petition for certiorari just buried the, that issue. They just buried that issue because they know right, they can't win that issue. let's talk about this. Let's okay. talk about this. Okay, because we've now, I think, established well why you think the 14th Amendment, Section 3, does apply to Trump. Right. But, but what happened Friday that was sort of a bombshell was the Supreme Court is going to hear this. Uh, they took. They had two options for cases they could take. They could have taken the Colorado GOP's case, which, in your own writing, said that was like a normal. That was a normal case. And then Trump did as he normally does, like a weirdo uh, case. But they took Trump's weirdo case. Yeah. So why? So tell me. T well, explain. because I think they. I. I think. Well, first of all, normally the Supreme Court, and I, I spell this out in the Atlantic piece that I published today. The Supreme Court doesn't take whole cases, really. It takes issues. It takes cases on the basis of the issues they present, and then it only takes some issues in a case. And those are the issues that are the most important to the country, whether it be because they affect more people or because they, there are conflicts in, this, in the circuit courts and the state Supreme Courts about them. They focus really on issues. They don't say, did the district court and this court of appeals get this right or wrong? and look for reasons to affirm or reverse. And what Trump's petition did, it did something that they would tell you not to do if you were taking a course in appellate advocacy. It basically said, was the Colorado Supreme Court right? I think that the best argument they, that, that Trump could possibly make here would be the one that you referred to as like, oh, well, he didn't, and I think it's weak, as I said, I, you know, he didn't engage in an insurrection because he didn't bear arms and march up to the hill. He, the Secret Service stopped him from going, and he didn't, you know, he didn't, he didn't issue specific orders to the proud, proud Boys or this group or that group. I don't think that gets him off the hook for engage, but it's actually the best argument he has. But right now, and, and because that, you know, it, it's the best argument he has, and it's the least likely, one of the least likely arguments for the Supreme Court to take, because you imagine to, to, to buy, because the Supreme Court, you imagine the Supreme Court saying, oh, he didn't engage in insurrection. They're never going to do that. They'd look like, you know, it would look terrible because everybody knows what really happened that day. Uh, but I think the reason why the Supreme Court took this, what I call blunderbuss, Cuisinart question that mixes everything in, is that they realize, too, that this case isn't really being well presented to them. And they have no idea how it's going to come out and what issues are going to matter and... So they want to keep their options open, too. So I think what they decided was, we got to move fast. People expect us to move fast. And we're just going to have to see how this all shakes out. And it's going to be, it's going to be rough and tumble, but we'll see. And I do think that they, they want to keep their options open because they, you know, they can probably see these questions aren't, you know, this is a big deal 
knocking this guy off the ballot. And right now, the principal issues that you look at and see aren't particularly strong for him. So, you, you know, they want to keep their options open because, you know, they, they, I, it's understandable that they would have trepidation in doing something that has never happened before. But, of course, the reason why it has never happened before is because we've never had a criminal like Donald Trump try to overturn the Constitution of the United States. And let me just ask you this. You know, I don't know. I was talking to a, a lawyer friend of mine, and one of the things she was saying is that oftentimes when people – put these questions or write these briefs, they have justices in mind that are their audience. Yes. That they yes. think they can persuade. Uh, right. So who do they, who does Trump and his lawyers think are their persuadable audience? I think they, they would, I mean, I, obviously there's raw partisanship that they are hoping would, would come, work in their favor. And I, and I honestly don't believe that's, that's what motivates these justices. Okay. Um, but I think you know, for example, with Roberts, Roberts is a cautious guy, right? He's, a, he's somebody who's very, very, understandably, as the Chief Justice of the United States, he's understandably concerned with the reputation of the court, and he wants to make sure that the court doesn't get too far out over its skis, which is why, for example, he wouldn't have overruled Roe, but he would have, he would have cut it back some. And that's why he, you know, he, he's, he's particularly um, concerned about stare decisis, and in this circumstance, this is, you know, and, and I'm sorry, you, you used a Latin phrase that I don't know. Stare decisis is the, is the general proposition that you stick to decisions that have been previously rendered and you don't yeah. say, oh, they're wrong and let's change precedent. the law. Precedent. Right, precedent. precedent. Yeah. You stick to precedent. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not always done. It doesn't, it's not a hard and fast rule. But he, 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 he very much, very much is cautious in that regard. So I think they're going to want to play on his cautiousness. And the fact of the matter is there are going to be, there are going to be people, uh, may, there could be the, some of the um, Democratic appointees may be cautious about this. I mean, we're seeing a lot of, of liberal commentators, I, not necessarily persuasively in my view, um, say that, oh, this is a terrible thing, disqualifying from there. They don't provide any good legal reason why he should not be disqualified. But there's a lot of concern by some of my liberal friends about, well, this is not a good thing. I think ultimately it comes down to their fear that the MAGA people will rise up in violence if the law is enforced against their guy. But they're going to do that. If they're going to do that, they're going to do that for any number of things, any number of legal consequences that might befall him. And I don't believe that we should not enforce the law simply because uh, people um, you know, want to intimidate us into not enforcing the law. So I talk too much. No, no, you're great. Okay, so just one another question. But so, what does this mean for the other states that are considering kicking Trump off the ballot? Right. So the Supreme Court takes it up, and I presume that whatever they come up with applies to every. It's going to be federal, right? It's going to apply to everybody. Well, not necessarily. Um, let me and I, let me explain why. I mean, if they say that. Section 14, I mean, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applies to the presidency. Yes, that will govern everybody. If they say that Section, 4, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is self-executing and doesn't require legislation by Congress and doesn't require a criminal conviction, yes, that will, that will control everybody. Um, on the other hand, the, the finding that he engaged in insurrection you know, they, they are going to review that on a deferential standard. And they're going to say that we can't, you know, we can't find error in that. And, you know, it could be that somebody could say, a court could say, well, that was the record in Colorado, but applying the definitions that the Supreme Court itself used in affirming the Colorado decision, we have a different record. And... Uh, we're going to come out a different way. So it's it's conceivable that the, the the Supreme Court's decision doesn't completely bind every other state with respect to the findings that the Colorado courts made on the particular record that was before them. Although, frankly, if a full record is presented to any fair tribunal, I think they get to the same result. I think the thing the the aspect of that that would apply to other states would be. If the Supreme Court says, 
here's what we think that the, 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 four, the framers of the 14th Amendment meant when they used the word insurrection. And they say an insurrection means X, and that engaging in an insurrection means Y. Well, X and Y would bind everybody. But if they do like what the Colorado Supreme Court did, which was to basically say, we don't have to decide which um, definition to use because he meets all of them. You know, I, 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 you, you, you could end up with, with um, well, I mean, that, that would be binding. I, I guess that would be binding on other courts. I, I, I think long, long, the, sh- the short answer to my long answer, short summary of my long answer is, I think it probably will bind the other states, but there are going to be, there are going to be wrinkles. And we have to see the procedural postures of the other, other states and how, how the issues come up in those states. I mean, to me, it just seems like the whole point of the Supreme Court taking this up is to get some kind of a resolution. So no, 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 I absolutely mean, it is. I think, are. I think it will, right. I think there will, be, there, there will be a lot more clarity, obviously, after they rule. I just, I'm just saying I can't guarantee that it will be the last word because we have no idea. We have no earthly idea what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And because I think in terms of the political calendar, so they are going to hear oral arguments February 8th, right? Correct. Which is just less than a month from now. And then how how long until they make a ruling on it? Like fast, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think they will move as fast as, say, the D.C. Circuit is going to move in the immunity case that's being argued on Tuesday. But it's conceivable that they could render a decision within a, I think the fastest you could expect this court to issue a decision would be in t- three weeks, maybe. Because I think it, it just takes, it's a nine member court, it takes a while. Or, you know, maybe, it could, maybe they can do it faster. The worst yeah, case. It puts you like five be, days out from Super Tuesday. Yeah, I, but, the, but the problem they have now already is that, you know, in Colorado, he's going to be on the ballot because they already, they already sent the ballots off to be printed. This, the, I don't think that this decision is going to be rendered in time to allow states, and I, I don't, look, I don't know what the ballot printing schedules are, to change what their ballots are going to be on Super Tuesday. I honestly don't think so. But I think, you know, it's important, obviously, for going forward to the later primaries and also, obviously, for the general election to know, you know, have some clarity on, on, on the scope of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and, you know, some guidance as to how it applies in this particular set of facts. You know, I'm so glad you brought that up because this is something that I've been wondering about. So it's conceivable that he gets knocked off some ballots, right. uh, and but not all. He still wins right. the primary. Right. Uh, and it's really then a question of the general election. So if, if whatever gets decided now, will that will apply to the general, or will it continue to get litigated the whole way through? I think that whoever loses may keep trying to litigate it if there's a, if there's a window for litigation. I think that... Um, I don't think, I'm, I'm not convinced necessarily that this is going to be the last word unless the Supreme Court holds, for example, that it just doesn't apply to the president or holds that under no set of circumstances could you have someone engage in an insurrection if they, unless they carry, were carrying at least a musket. Okay? If, if, if they hold something like that, then that, that, could wipe out, that could wipe out all the disqualification efforts. But other than that, it's possible, as I said, that, 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 that they may prescribe, they may say, yeah, it does apply to the president. Yeah, it does apply without a conviction. And um, on this record, it, 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 the, the findings, we can't overturn the findings. Um, you know, they, there's gonna, they'll still look for error in the decision, I think. That's the thing. We'll see. Okay. It's, we're, we're, it's, it's really hard to say in the abstract. You actually have to have an opinion. Um, and, then, and then even then... It could be that people are going to try to sit there. They're going to be noodling for weeks trying to figure out, well, what, what, what's, what's open to, to litigate anymore. So. Have you seen anything like this before in no. American history? No. Like, I, I want but, people to understand and kind of get but, their heads around how wild. And even no, I was is. like, ooh. The, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was, I was like, I mean, oh, this is crazy. But, like, my friends who are lawyers are like, no, 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 you don't understand this right. is the most bananas thing ever. We've never seen anything like it. Tell us how crazy right. well, it is. Well, it's it's bananas not in the sense that that it's legally bananas. It's bananas that we have 
somebody, a, pre, a man who is likely to be a major party nominee for president who you could even make the argument about should be disqualified. I mean, there's a good point that my friend Ed Whalen made the other day on Twitter was like, even if he's not disqualified, even if the law is, is what he says it is, just consider the fact that we're even talking about this. And it's because this guy basically tried to overturn the Constitution. So uh, that's what's bananas about this. What's bananas about this is that he's still there. He's still out there. The Republicans take him seriously. That he, well, What's bananas was, as you pointed out earlier, that he wasn't um, barred from seeking future public office by the United States Senate when it faced, you know, when it, when it uh, uh, tried him on the impeachment charges. Um, that's what's bananas. He's bananas. The situation, yeah. the political situation in the country is bananas. So the fact that there's litigation that seems bananas and could reach a bananas, seemingly bananas result is this flows from all the other bananas that are floating around out there. Yeah, that makes total sense. It's a lot of bananas. Yep. George yep. Conway. Okay. Yes, yeah, so and we don't want to be a banana republic. We don't. We don't. That's right. It's a That's great way point, to close yeah. this. This, yeah. this, this weird segment we've done. Uh, but guys, if you want us to do this more, you can tell us in the comments. I know that I still am not 100% clear on what's going on, but I am like 60% better after having listened to George. I hope you are too. Um, yeah. And uh, I want to thank George. George, thanks for thank uh, sharing some of your wisdom. Happy it was great. It.